Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a year active debate supported by the Nickel Institute. Now, this morning, we're going to be discussing due diligence and responsible sourcing and whether there can be a common approach for all sectors. A big thank you, of course, to everyone who is joining us online. Um, and a reminder that if you have a question or a comment, don't forget to send it into our chat page, along with the name of the panelist, its director, and we'll pick out some of your questions for later on in the programme. So do get involved. So two years in the making. In February this year, the European Commission came out with its long awaited draft proposal for a directive on corporate sustainability and due diligence. Now, the proposal aims to foster sustainable and responsible corporate behavior by making companies think about the impact that their overall operation and supply chains are having on human rights and the environment. Now, given that the EU exports hundreds of millions of euros worth of goods and imports hundreds of millions more, it was important to define and redefine standards and also to make sure that the most powerful of players do not go unchecked. The questions remain over coverage. Will this new legislation apply across all companies and all industries here in the EU? And what about third countries? Well, let's ask the experts. Joining me for this debate are Anna Athana Sopalu, Head of Proximity, Social Economy and Creative Industries at the European Commission's Director General GRO. We also have French left MEP Manon Aubre. She's also a member of the Justice Committee at the European Parliament. And importantly for this debate, Shadow Rapporteur for the European Parliament's draft report on sustainable corporate governance. Next, we have Barbara Bielik, uh, Deputy Head of Due Diligence and Legal Expert at the Responsible Business Conduct Centre at the OECD. We also have Yann Notre Dame, uh, Senior Advisor at Corporate Sponsor. Corporate Social Responsibility Europe. We also have Elena Lunder, who's Policy and Project Advisor at Fair Trade Advocacy uh, Office. And also we have Dr. Veronique Stuckers, uh, Director of Health and Environment and Public Policy at the Nickel Institute. Okay, well, a big welcome to all of you. And as you guys who are watching online will be noticing, um, our panel is made of some big heavy hitters in the industry. So to help you all understand who they all are and what level of ex expertise they bring to this debate. They'll now be given a few minutes to introduce themselves. So let's go in order of introduction. Let me start um, with Ms. Athana Sopalu, Head of Proximity, Social Economy and Creative Industries at the European Commission's DJ Grove. Please take the floor, you have a few minutes. Yes, uh, good morning, yes, uh, everybody. Morning. Um, now I think uh, there's no echo, so I can uh, properly start. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mariam. You already uh, introduced uh, the the identity of the uh, legal proposal of, of the Commission. Uh, I represent here um, um, one of the two services of the European Commission who have worked on this proposal under the responsibility of two commissioners, uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton, responsible for internal market, and Commissioner Didier Renders, uh, responsible for the protection of uh, consumers. Um, so uh, what is it? Uh, you already said it's a directive uh, for sustainable co corporate uh, due diligence. Um, it's currently the proposal is on the table in a negotiation between the EU governments and the European Parliament. It's a proposal uh, um, that brings on the table uh, for companies uh, also administrative sanctions and civil liability. That's new. And it's a first ever horizontal uh, legislation on due diligence. Um, we didn't have, we don't have anywhere a legislation like that. So that was actually, it shows the measure of the challenge uh, that uh, we have. Uh, we had as a commission to put the proposal and prepare it, but also for the two co-legislatures which are currently discussing it. Um, in terms of scope, it covers both EU and non-EU companies and companies of a certain size that represent, um, on the side of EU companies, 50% of EU turnover. So these are companies with a certain capacity uh, to actually um, bring this uh, shift in corporate behavior we would like to see uh, along their value chains, which are complex and global. Small and medium enterprises are not in the scope, so they're out. So you may be asking why this proposal and why now? I mean, we have been observing for some period that indeed there is a number of companies um, uh, that uh, implement due diligence, but uh, not all of them have the clarity that they need because they have been using so far voluntary standards. 
And this is what we're changing now. We are creating a legal standard for the EU in the hope that it will be also a model and an example for other countries to uh, follow. Um, so it was about voluntary standards and um, it was also the desire and the political ambition to bring this shift in corporate behavior um, to also create an even basis for transparency, for accountability and uh, accompany companies uh, towards sustainability, to towards climate neutrality and human rights responsibility, all of the uh, political, shared political ambitions and values uh, that the EU represents, whether we're looking at the European Green Deal and uh, the goal of climate neutrality by 2050 or a just transition for all, or overall the attachment of the EU to um, uh, sustainable uh, development goals. So maybe I would like briefly to mention five key co um, considerations that um, lie behind the proposal and the Commission uh, carefully considered uh, those elements uh, when uh, um, putting the proposal on the table and actually you will see them uh, when, when you go through the draft. First of all, as I mentioned, it's about this culture of no harm in corporate behaviour, but also bringing more transparency for investors and consumers. There's clear trends both on the side of uh, investors and funding markets, but also on the side of consumers. They need more transparency about the impacts of companies have on the environment, on human rights and uh, on people. Then a second consideration is about uh, defragmentation in the single market and creating legal certainty. Uh, there's already two member states, uh, France and Germany, in which there is national legislation, which is horizontal. Another one where there is uh, um, legislation on child labor. And we knew that more legislation was going to come. Obviously, not an ideal situation when you're looking at companies operating in the single market. So this is something that we try to anticipate and prevent. Um, third element and very important is about consistency. Consistency with existing and upcoming EU rules and legislations, consistency with the international um, uh, voluntary standards, OECD and UN. So we have uh, really looked as much as we could to uh, have this consistency in place, whether we're looking at um, existing EU diligence legislation on timber, on conflict minerals, but also on upcoming rules under deforestation or batteries, which is actually in the hands of the two co-legislators. Um, and also consistency when it comes to reporting requirements on companies um, so that they're not lost uh, in all the uh, requirements that uh, they, they're faced with when it comes to sustainability. Um, so there again, we try to pull everything together. Fourth consideration and very important uh, is about proportionality. Because looking at our proposal and the proposal of the Commission, you will recognize the, the ambition, the political ambition to really bring this shift and um, open this path uh, for the future, for the first time. Uh, but also we need to make sure that the rules that we put in place are implementable for companies and the industry and they have the capacity to do so. So this element of proportionality, you will find it in the scope that is proposed, the obligations and the toolbox that companies have in their um, hands to implement due diligence, um, uh, but also in terms of the civil liability and the other elements of the proposal. And the fifth consideration is about collaboration, the collaboration that we would like to see among different actors, um, industry and NGOs within different actors of industry in certain sectors, uh, between member states, uh, with third countries and partner countries. Uh, so the proposal recognizes this reality. And maybe I will finish with this, uh, with the last element. Um, obviously, the proposal creates obligations for companies. And these obligations generate a certain uh, level of financial and, uh, and practical burden to put in place. Um, and we're very much aware of that. We're also very much aware of the fact that although small and medium enterprises are not in the scope, they will be uh, affected because they're present and part of value chains. So this is why uh, a sizable part of this proposal is devoted to what we, accompany, what we call accompanying measures, measures that the Commission, in cooperation with the Member States and other actors, will try to put in place in order to facilitate the implementation of this legislation for uh, companies, for SMEs and also for uh, Member States. Whether um, we're looking at guidelines, whether we're looking at technical support or a financial support. And of course, we will continue mobilizing all the um, 
support and uh, leverage we have in the context of development cooperation and trade uh, policy to continue um, on one hand pushing the agenda on sustainability uh, and corporate uh, sustainability due diligence but also see how we can do it in partnership with um, third countries to make sure that uh, uh, what we would like to see trickles down uh, in, through global value chains. So, uh, as I mentioned, the proposal is now in the hands of the national governments in the Council and uh, the European Parliament. We're obviously very much involved and in participating in the process. And um, this would be the time, because it would be a few years before the legislation kicks in, it will be the time where we can all help all sides uh, companies, but also NGOs and other actors to actually prepare for when the new rules kick in. Okay, Anna, that is so blue. Thank you so much. I mean, actually, my, my, my first question was going to be to you to kind of give us a kind of grounding as to what this proposed legislation is. I think you've done that. Okay, you also did mention that, you know, this uh, legislation is now being discussed and it is partly in the hands of the European Parliament. So let's go over then to our MEP, um, Manon Opre, please take the floor for a few minutes. Thanks very much, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I hope you hear me well, right? You do? Yes, I guess you do. All right, thanks. Um, so yes, it's been a long awaited proposal, definitely, uh, for all of us uh, having worked uh, on the issue of due diligence for quite some time now. Um, I should say that um, obviously uh, our um, parliament has been working hard on putting together a proposal that has been done beforehand and before the commission's proposal. And it's, it's clear that as much as we welcome the move from the uh, Commission to actually put forward a proposal, it's also clear that it, it has some limits um, and it falls short on several points uh, that are different from the proposal we've, we've made at the Parliament's level. I should say first, sorry, an introduction that my perspective uh, is, is kind of twofold. I've been working um, on the field for several years in, in several African countries uh, working on human rights violations. So it's also a field perspective. And I've also been working on the French proposal. So it's also interesting to compare the French due diligence proposal and the EU proposal. I should say that both have some uh, good elements and both have some uh, limits in the way they can be implemented. And the interesting point on the French proposal, obviously, is that now it's been implemented, Im implemented for a few years. So we now know um, exactly, you know, uh, what are the limits. And the limits, it's clearly access to justice for victims, but I'm going to get back to it. Um, just a few words on the, on the Commission's proposal. I think the main issue lies on the, um, the over-reliance, uh, over, uh, re sorry, on contractual assurances. Um, the issue that um, companies uh, should adopt contractual clauses uh, that will clearly shift the responsibility onto the first tier um, of suppliers, which kind of you know moves away from the perspective of the whole supply chain. And I know the argument will be that this will um, you know go from one layer to another, but I think this kind of leaves the responsibility, especially of the parent company, uh, and this replaces taking concrete action um, and concrete due diligence measure. Um, by basically administrative paperwork. And this is, at this stage, the main worry we have uh, from, you know, the, 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 the MEPs that have been involved in the legislative proposal at, at the Parliament's level. And I fear that the responsibility is therefore watered down in the supply chains and we can't expect significant improvements in terms of sourcing. So that's, for me and for us, the main issue. Of course, you've been mentioning very quickly um, the threshold that is also much higher in the Commission's proposal than uh, the Parliament's proposal. Uh, and there's some doubt on how um, and to what extent this will cover all risky companies. And then the uh, Parliament's proposal was also a little bit more detailed on, for example, stakeholders' involvement and stakeholders' engagement that is very key to ensure that there's you know, genuine participation and uh, genuine uh, involvement of stakeholders. Uh, the Commission uh, proposes that companies consult re relevant stakeholders where relevant 
and that where relevant is highly problematic to us because um, involvement should should be should always be relevant, uh, especially when when you do such kind of uh, of uh, process. And then um, in terms of access to justice, um, there were two important things uh, that are missing or too weak uh, in the Commission's proposal. One is something um, that we had fight for actually in the French proposal and that we all equally failed to get, which is the reversal of the burden of the proof. We are dealing here with victims that are, you know, not, a lot of the times uh, based on the other side of the world, uh, don't necessarily uh, speak the same language, uh, don't, um, you know, know the, the law of the country or even the EU law. And the, the reversal of the burden of the proof would clearly puts the responsibility over the company rather than uh, the victims that most of the time don't have the capacity to actually bring a case to justice. And equally, the sanctions that we did propose um, in the, uh, in the uh, Parliament's proposal, uh, for example, was referring to competition law, and I think was much more efficient to, um, to be more dissuasive for companies Obviously, the objective was that proposal, and we, we would all agree on that, would not be to sanction companies, to eventually sanction companies. The objective is, of course, to change uh, the behavior of companies beforehand and not get to the point of sanctions. But that's part of the game that sanction can, can help changing the behavior of companies because they then include this in their risk assessment that we all know they already do. So those are a, a few key points that, um, you know, to highlight the differences between the Commission's proposal and the Parliament's proposal. And those are the points on which we are going to work in the coming months together with the Commission's, uh, hopefully, uh, to try to strengthen the proposal. There's been weighted uh, by NGOs in particular, and I speak with both my NGO hats and uh, my MEP hat, has been weighted for more than 10 years now. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get it through before the end uh, of the mandate of both the, the Parliament and the Commission. Indeed, and I think, um, Ms. Aubrey, um, I think the main thing that I took from what you said there was the word responsibility. And I think for our viewers, it's also interesting to see, um, having followed on from the Commission, the way in which legislation um, is moulded. Um, so definitely we'll continue that discussion, but over to our next um, panelist, Barbara Bietsch, please take the floor for a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. So my name is Barbara Bielich and I lead our work on the financial sector and regulatory engagement in the OECD and the RBC Center. Um, the RBC Center, our main objective is really promoting and implementing the OECD guidelines. And in recent years, uh, regulatory engagement has become a huge uh, pillar of the work, actually, because we're seeing so many laws being introduced uh, on due diligence um, based on our instruments the guidelines, but also our due diligence framework. And of course, the initiative at the EU is one of the most um, prominent, uh, taking a lot of attention, um, but there's also been a lot of initiatives uh, across the world on specific risk areas like forced labor, like minerals uh, in the United States, Australia, and across um, European countries. So um, in the context of this work, I mean, we really understand that national policy governing company conduct or even EU policy governing uh, company conduct will naturally differ based on uh, the domestic priorities and also context, but uh, we really feel that it's important to have um, aligned policies to avoid proliferation of different expectations that can create uh, overlap, fragmentation, or even conflicting laws in certain cases and lead to confusion in the market and also, of course, higher compliance costs for companies. Um, and in this respect, we think it's um, a great initiative by the EU to try to sort of develop a market um, level framework on these expectations in the EU. Um, we would note though, however, so so from our perspective, you know, mandatory expectations on due diligence, they're, they're one of several tools in the toolbox for policymakers to promote responsible business conduct. There are various other um, issues and tools that um, policymakers can draw on in promoting these issues like trade investment agreements, providing financial incentives and support and training, uh, information sharing, convening stakeholders. Um, but of course, this is an important tool. And at the OECD, we don't 
necessarily promote mandatory expectations, but where they're introduced, uh, we think it's very important that they align with international expectations and existing international instruments like the OECD due diligence framework and guidelines. And this is to avoid uh, some of the proliferation and fragmentation I referred to before. Uh, we think the proposal by the commission and also the initial proposal by the parliament went a long way in trying to align with international standards. So there's sort of explicit reference to the OECD instruments. Um, we saw that the commission's proposal has been sort of modeled across a six-step six framework, the six measures that we recommend under our own framework. Um, and we ourselves have engaged with sort of the, the relevant policymakers uh, in, in the EU bodies to ensure this alignment. Um, but we think there are certain areas that could be further strengthened to, to underscore um, that alignment. And that's specifically in terms of some of the more substantive concepts that are really fundamental to um, the OECD due diligence recommendations and also the UNGPs. And I think maybe just to highlight one in my initial remarks is really the importance of a risk-based approach. Um, Manon mentioned a little bit, you know, where she sees some of the, the challenges with current law. Um, I think some of those relate to the lack of risk-based approach, um, one that's sort of focused on really, I think, in the interest of trying to establish legal certainty, um, calling on practitioners to focus on established business relationships, to use sort of um, very clear and concrete tools like contractual assurances and audits uh, across a predefined set of risks. You know, this all provides greater certainty for companies on what's expected, but it doesn't necessarily orient them towards doing due diligence across the risk areas in their value chains where there's the most uh, potential for negative impact. Um, so it might um, inadvertently lead to a lot of effort being expended on uh, issues and actions that, that don't go to prevent mitigate those impacts. Um, so we recognize the challenge of sort of trying to translate a voluntary instrument into a legal framework. Um, that's that's definitely uh, easier said than done. And particularly something like a risk-based approach that's sort of uh, very context specific, dynamic, um, will evolve um, based on the context, but also companies' own uh, priorities and, and uh, journey, I guess, in terms of implementation of, of due diligence. Um, but this is one area we think that there could be sort of further refinement and strengthening um, in the law. So I'm, I'm happy to speak to that uh, more later. But broadly, I think um, we want to commend the EU on this initiative and just generally in terms of support for the responsible business conduct agenda and really the objectives uh, behind this initiative and all the other work happening on sustainable finance, uh, sustainability disclosures, um, and the like, there's really, we see a huge push to share, to change culture of corporations in, in, Euro in Europe and globally, um, and uh, that should be recognized. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bielich. And it's good to see that, of course, um, you know, as a representative of the OECD, that you do support um, this draft legislation, but you also feel that there obviously can be some tweaks to be made. Something we will discuss, but over to Jan Notre Dame. Um, please take the floor now, you have a few minutes. Yes, thank you, Mariam, and uh, thank you for being invited. Um, today I am speaking for CSI Europe. It stands for Corporate Sustainability and Responsibility. It is a 25 years young organization. It was initiated by Jacques Delors and a number of leading companies. Um, now, CSI Europe has quite a bold position regarding the um, EU proposal. We are for an integrated EU policy on due diligence that is walking on two legs. Of course, the new regulation uh, proposal is out and we are in favor. It has to put the ultimate responsibility for due diligence on each individual company, while also equipping victims of abuses to hold companies accountable. That is all about the duty to care. But it needs, as it was mentioned also by um, Ma Mrs. Aubry regarding the stakeholder involvement, also Anna speaking about collaboration and accompanying measures, it needs strong accompanying measures to support, uh, it has been said, the involvement of producers, but also uh, the collaboration with all stakeholders. This is what we at CISA Europe, we call the duty to collaborate. 
we're even speaking with the UN guiding principles on human rights to see how this can be uh, a new term that can be embedded into the uh, principles. And today um, we see that this second leg or this second pillar of accompanying measures are poorly covered. You have an article 14 that is a good start, but indeed, I think it was mentioned by um, Mrs. Aubry, you cannot say where necessary or where relevant. We think there is a duty to collaborate and for companies and industry sectors and civil society and also for governments and the European Commission. Uh, there is a joint responsibility to see how we can accelerate the awareness and capacity building of thousands and thousands of um, involved partners. The SMEs were mentioned. Also large companies are very often um, not so well equipped when you go into the field. Um, and if we don't do that, if there is not a more integrated, ambitious approach, we will be less credible. We will not um, manage to have real impact on the ground. And the ultimate goal of all what we are discussing today, including this regulation, is where is Europe going to help enhance the livelihoods of farmers, of miners, of workers? And if it's only through uh, a smart regulation, we fear we're not going to get there. So that is why we are promote, proposing um, and will further propose under Article 14 a more robust duty to collaborate. Um, and for instance, the proposal for uh, Europe to create or to support um, European sector alliances on due diligence for industry sectors and for stakeholders, public or civil society, to benefit all from open source risks analysis. Here I give an example on the raw materials outlook. It's an instrument that CISA Europe has been developing with 11 automotives going about each single raw material and where it is associated with uh, risks in terms of human rights uh, and uh, environment. But also European sector alliances to reinforce, of course, the future European horizontal law with sector guidelines, uh, to engage a broader dialogue that touches on all due diligence related issues including purchase practices. This is not being discussed very often. It's under the carpet. But last but not least, sector alliances to also explore, identify, and develop sector and cross-sector projects in the field uh, to have uh, an approach where locally in the field you address the root causes of the problems. And for instance, where you together create or diversify economic activities, especially in the regions where um, extraction is a kind of monopoly in the hands of uh, military uh, illegal forces. So that is our approach towards uh, the current proposal of the Commission. And we hope that in the weeks to come, in a dialogue with the Commission and the Parliament and governments, we can reinforce Article 14 so that we have a strong duty to care by companies with a strong duty to collaborate by all parties. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, not Stan, I think it's really important of, you know, when we talk about legislation um, and you did just talk about, you know, the help that this legislation can also provide to the people who are part of the supply chain itself. Okay, thank you so much. And we'll discuss, of course, all of that in more detail a bit later on, but now to Eleanor Linda, please take the floor. Thank you, Miriam, and thank you for having me today. Um, yeah, as uh, I already introduced, um, I work as a um, policy and project advisor at the Fair Trade Advocacy Office, where we catalyze collaboration within the international fair trade movement on policy, advocacy, and campaigning activity, and facilitate knowledge co-creation and sharing on fair trade policies and practices, and lead advocacy work on European Union legislation, policies, and their implementation. So here um, I am leading our work on the um, legislative proposal on corporate sustainability due diligence. And um, since the start of our engagement on this, on this file, 
we have focused on ensuring that the legislative proposal would have positive impacts uh, in global value chains on rights holders, such as workers, smallholder farmers, um, artisanal miners. Lately, um, we have focused specifically more on, on smallholder farmers. We see, or, or the due diligence framework, as it has been established in the past 10 years, um, is, is inherently a rights holder centric instrument, and we should see it this way also in the European conversation and consider all rights holders' interests um, while in, in the discussions preceding uh, the, the, the legislation and enduring uh, transposition and implementation. So as I mentioned at our, uh, at our office, we're focusing on the impacts on smallholder farmers. So I would also like to focus on this today, um, where we see smallholder farmers producing a third of the world's food supply um, and play an an important role in several global value chains, but might be left out of the considerations uh, when talking about this proposal. Um, due to their position in, in global value chains, um, as mentioned also before, there's this danger that actors that are placed more at the start of global value chains, um, such as producers um, or artisanal miners, would not be um, reached with the benefits of, of the proposal. So um, for that, um, I would actually I would like to focus on on two specific points uh, in my opening, where um, I would take purchasing practices um, from under the, under the carpet. Uh, we see that um, already in existing um, due diligence frameworks uh, before the legislative proposal, there is this tendency um, of companies passing costs um, of of diver diverse procedures um, through the supply chain to. Um, their suppliers with, uh, with, with less power due to, to um, pervasive asymmetrical power relations in global value chains. So um, producers globally, um, not just smallholder farmers, but actors across sectors receive prices below the cost of production, except short lead times and other unfavorable terms um, that make it near to impossible to um, to produce in a sustainable way or to apply the new due diligence standards that as planned by the proposal as it stands now would be passed on through um, contractual assurances, um, which, which we see as highly problematic because it, it is then in practice a passing on of responsibility without any obligation to cooperate um, in, and, and take the, the responsibility that is commensurate to one's uh, leverage and ability uh, to impact. So we have seen, as, as I mentioned, experience in the mining sector has shown that without um, appropriate mechanisms that would ensure um, the equitable sharing of responsibility, some stronger actors are encouraged or not encouraged. They, they have the ability and they, they take the ability um, to pass on the costs of the supply chain without addressing their own purchasing practices to enable implementation of their partners. And they at the same time retain value further down um, in, in uh, their own uh, op operating spaces. The own initiative report of the European Parliament already addressed purchasing practices to some extent. We would propose to go beyond that um, and, and really uh, embed the, the element of purchasing practices at every level of the due diligence uh, process. Um, so, of course, the entire process should rely on, on active stakeholder engagement at every step. Um, and there are other important elements on how to ensure better cooperative conditions, um, but I hope we can go into that a bit later. We definitely can. Okay, um, to our final uh, panelist, Dr. Veronique Stukas, uh, please do take the floor for a few minutes. Thank you very much. So I'm with the Nikkel Institute and we represent the global producers of uh, well, our members are global producers of nickel and nickel compounds. And the nickel industry, well, we are part of the mining and metals industry, obviously. We support in general due diligence and responsible sourcing requirements, as also laid out in the um, proposed directive. And our members are currently really identifying and addressing ESG risks, and we are investing significant efforts as well in developing frameworks that allow that to demonstrate um, compliance. For us, it's very important that there is um, consistency and coherence between the different requirements. We do have different legal frameworks that uh, will apply to nickel specifically, such as also the battery regulation. 
And we have to make sure that the work that all companies are doing um, can be used actually for different purposes. And uh, all the initiatives in the end do have the same goal where it comes to due diligence and responsible sourcing. So alignment of activities can really create very significant um, benefits for everybody. With respect to voluntary initiatives, which I've already heard referring to, there are already quite a number of voluntary initiatives that exist since quite a while. And the industry is already using this to comply with either legal requirements or value chain requirements. And many of these have gone through very robust approval processes and are actively used by the company. So it's important that they are considered and that they are accepted, especially if the process is based on communication, transparency, and overseen by multi-stakeholder structures, and also when they have alignment with the OCD and the UN guiding principles, because that alignment process does take quite a while as well. And then finally, with respect to timing, uh, we just want to make sure that industry does have sufficient time because looking at even existing standards or frameworks, but also frameworks on the development, it takes quite a lot of time to get stakeholder invol involvement, buy-in, um, uh, and to, to also get regulatory approval, to get um, OCD alignment, well, approval with OCD alignment and uh, United Nations guidelines. So timing is very critical, and this is not something that can be done just in, in one week or so, especially if then afterwards the companies have to go through the framework and through the auditing process. So I'll leave it at this, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you to all of you for giving your sort of opening statements. Um, one thing to mention for all of our viewers as well, um, we understand that um, Emily um, Opre, she needs to leave in about, I think, half an hour. So if you do have questions for her, please do put them into our chat page, especially. And also for the panelists too, if you have any questions that you would also like to direct um, to our representative of the European Parliament, stick them in um, and let me know as well. Okay, so let's kick off the, the, the discussion, the debate. And I'll come to Ms. Athana Sopalu first. So you've heard from all the other panelists and there has been some criticism about this um, draft uh, proposal from the European Commission. You know, other panelists talking about rights holders, human rights. Um, do you think the criticism of this draft proposal in the form that it's in right now is fair? Uh, well, I, I have never seen any proposal, legislative proposal presented by the Commission without receiving uh, criticism. I think this is the healthy element of our uh, working methods and, and uh, methods in the EU to, to uh, actually produce legislation. Oh, unfortunately, the commission seems to have gone offline. Okay, uh, Manu Opre, maybe um, as a representative of the other institution, the European Parliament, if you could perhaps take over. Um, please go ahead. <laughs> well, I don't know whether there should be a, a sign on the commission dropping on at the moment to answer some of the critics of the proposal. Um, just to, to give maybe a bit of more background of the proposal, um, because, you know, we've been uh, working a lot with the DG Just, just I don't know how you say it in English, uh, DG Justice, um, that has been quite progressive, I should say. Um, and it was, um, I had doubts on the implication of the other uh, direction at the Commission's level, because it only made the proposal more complicated and it only watered down all in all the, the proposal. And we have a similar conflict at the moment in the parliament with, I, I don't remember how many uh, committees asking uh, for opinions on the proposal. And I'm just worried also that it's gonna further delay and water down um, the, the, the proposal because now we need to move forward. The good point from the parliament's level is that we've already done the work and it's been tough work, but we've already done the work for months discussing and negotiating our proposal in our legislative proposal. Uh, although, as you all know, we, we don't have the right to propose, but our report is very clear in laying down some of the uh, directive elements that we expect. 
And one thing to keep in mind is that we've managed to get an agreement that goes from the left, the group that I'm representing, uh, up to the EPP group. So there's been a wide consensus in the parliament. So a very ambitious proposal, um, both in terms of uh, threshold, uh, in terms of covering the whole supply chain, uh, in terms of access to justice for victims, and in terms of sanction. And I think those are the elements that all together make a strong uh, due diligence proposal. Uh, and I, I do understand that there can be, and there's been in our negotiation, a uh, discussion on whether we should need um, a sectoral approach. The, um, uh, the, the approach that we had both in the parliament and in the commission, and we value that in the commission's proposal, is that it, it needs to be cross-sectoral. Um, of course, this can be in, you know, further supported by some sectoral guidelines, for example, and it's clear that, let's say, in the mining sector, it will be different um, as in, I don't know, any other uh, type of, of sector. But we need to have a strong cross-sectoral proposal in the way the, do, the due diligence is designed and the way we can hold companies responsible. Then in terms of implementation, it's clear that there will be different guidance based on sector and based on how long the supply chain, for example, is uh, based on the type of activities you have, whether you're labor intensive or not. And those are the specificities that will definitely be taken into account, but should be taken into account at the, at the second stage when it comes to uh, implementing guidelines. And to that extent, it's interesting to see that it's a similar approach that the one the OECD had. You know, you have the guidelines at the OECD level that has been complemented by uh, sexual approaches and sexual guidelines that I think uh, are interesting and useful. And by the way, I, I also thank uh, the role of the OECD that has been quite useful in designing our proposal from uh, the Parliament's uh, side. I don't know if you have any further questions for me that can be, of which I can be. hundred percent, we have further questions for you. Um, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to pick up on uh, was access to victims. You know, there's a lot of people who are going to be watching this who are thinking, well, what do you exactly mean by that? So if you could sort of, you know, in more detail explain what exactly that means. Well, take, for example, I don't know, one of the terrible events like the Rana Plaza one, it's been now seven or eight years, uh, it was the anniversary not long ago, um, where you have the, the whole factory that does collapse um, uh, with, with, with many victims in the factory. And if, if we could find uh, some elements of some big brands like Kamayu and others, uh, and the, the issue is to what extent we can hold accountable those companies. But the families in Bangladesh, you know, in, in practice, think, think in practice, how can they hold accountable a company that has its headquarters in France, in Spain, or in other uh, EU countries? It's obviously very difficult. And if it's up to the victim of the family or of the victim to prove that the company is responsible, it's obviously very difficult for, for a family living in Bangladesh, not speaking French or any other language, not even speaking English, and not obviously having any access to uh, any sort of EU court. Of course, NGOs can play a role, they can support civil society, they can support victims, but that's why we're calling for a reversal of the burden of the proof. And the idea is that it's up to the company to prove whether the company is responsible or not. And of course, the company, I guess, will try to prove that it's not responsible because the company has much more capacities to do so. And I think that's something that is definitely possible, that is legally possible in EU law, that is possible at national level as well, and that is definitely necessary and needed if at the end of the day our overall objective is for victims to access justice. I think that should be the number one priority. And ideally, of course, victims not to have to ask for justice because damage will be uh, prevented, whether they are human rights or envir environmental damages. And this is why from an NGO perspective, from a victim's perspective, the reversal of the burden of the proof is very key. We had it uh, in the Parliament's proposal and we're going to fight for it in uh, the final discussion we're going to have with the Commission. Okay, thank you so much. Um, 
Perhaps, Jan Oster, would you like to jump in there? Because I know that you're also speaking about this as well, before we go back to the Commission. No, I can only go with uh, Manon Aubry. Um, our concern is, what do you do to prevent uh, more victims? And so this is a cultural element. Where do you equip? Where do you raise awareness day after day? How do you involve all departments and not just the legal affairs in companies that will keep the sheet clean? Um, and where do we make sure that this future directive on due diligence will not end to become another tick the box exercise or to generate other layers of audits, which at the end we all know do not make or don't bring a lot of uh, uh, change. So as much there is a concern about uh, when a violation happens for uh, the, the right for victims to uh, seek justice, of course, and, and reparation, but where is it that we uh, go under the iceberg and make sure that we go about a cultural change inside companies. And that is where creation of trust through uh, sector alliances is for us key. Uh, and not just for uh, sector guidelines. It goes far more than guidelines. If you go into the field, uh, then many people say, well, Europe, thank you very much for your guidelines, for the principles and the new regulations. But where does it change my life? My daughter is not helping me anymore in the farm. And on top, I have to pay to get a label for fair trade, something. So there is something out there where we have to go much deeper and further and responsibilize the industry associations that for 40 years have been extremely reactive, conservative. Now we have to be proactive and see where we design solutions on the ground. And this is also asking us to invest and bear the cost well, also with companies. Um, from the Commission and Ms. Athana Sopoulou. Um, you're hearing what, 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 what the other panelists are saying. What do you say then? In, is this legislation really holding multinationals accountable or not? And are you ignoring, you know, the smallest person in the chain? Uh, yes, thanks uh, for that. And sorry, uh, my connection was uh, failed me uh, earlier. Um, maybe I can take both of your questions because uh, there was a number of points and you asked uh, whether uh, how we see this uh, criticism. Um, I What I have heard so far uh, is rather, um, I wouldn't take it as a criticism on the fundamental logic of, of the proposal. So what is reassuring in a way is that uh, perhaps we have uh, managed to strike an overall right balance in the packaging of the proposal, which is the, the was the first biggest step, because uh, it's the first time that we're putting a proposal on horizontal due diligence uh, and shifting from voluntary international standards, whether we're looking at OECD or the UN, and into um, legal standards together with um, uh, harmonized civil liability. Uh, to, w w attached to it and that's a big shift so um, then it's a question of emphasis I would say on a number of points that of course will be fine-tuned during the, the negotiations and the discussions perhaps on the point of um, uh, accountability of uh, companies and how we can make sure that uh, uh, when we're discussing about a duty on due diligence it's not a, a ticking the box exercise but it's really bringing this cultural shift the shift of culture uh, of no harm in companies. Um, first of all, we are more or less, uh, based on research, aware that about 30% of large companies do perform a due diligence, but only a very small fraction of them, uh, almost half and less, are doing it uh, all on the, um, uh, in the perspective of the value chain. With our proposal, uh, we are pushing for this to change. Uh, companies have to integrate due diligence in the overall uh, exercise in, across the board into their business model. Um, they have to uh, put in place also uh, action plans and they have, or at least the proposal equips them with a toolbox uh, for them to perform due diligence. 
contractual assurances is one element of the toolbox. But for us, it's not necessarily a tool that would mean shifting of responsibility because responsibility and civil liability stays with a company that falls in the scope, stays with a company who's at the top of the value chain and it's not shifted down to, to its suppliers. This is clear and the proposal is very clear on that. And I would like to clarify this point. Uh, at the same time, uh, although contractual assurances are there, also because it's a reality on the ground, it's how uh, um, business relations are being uh, organized, what we have tried to do is to bring safeguards, safeguards to protect um, smaller actors in the value chain or uh, companies in third countries, in developing countries, from possible unfair behavior by larger EU companies. Um, and there, um, there is uh, um, concrete elements in the proposal that ask these companies to invest, to build capacity in smaller actors in case of audits to actually bear the cost of these audits. And uh, we have devoted a big part of the proposal, clear um, uh, point in the proposal, to really discourage companies from disengaging from risky areas or risky activities, but rather engaging positively in order to help actors on the ground, those who don't have the capacity, to actually shift towards uh, more sustainable uh, practices, uh, whether we're talking about respect of human rights or respect for the environment and uh, people communities more, more generally. So uh, I think what is important is really to uh, go in uh, quite deeply in the proposal to understand the logic behind it. Um, so on that point, I tried to explain it. When it comes to the... Um, uh, duty of collaboration. Um, there again, uh, it's it's clear and you can find it in different parts of the proposal. I already mentioned this push uh, that we're trying to, uh, to have for B2B collaboration, I will call it, collaboration along the value chain in order to safeguard and protect uh, SMEs, basically, although they're out of the scope or actors in, in third countries, um, but also collaboration across sectors, uh, collaboration under industry schemes or stakeholder uh, collaboration. Uh, the proposal is very clear there. Now, is whether we can adapt uh, the Let's, let's question, bring in but... um, some of the other panelists as well. Um, oh, Barbara's back. Um, okay, Barbara uh, Bielish, let me come to you then. Um, so, you know, as you were saying in your opening statement as well, um, the OECD has really been part of international efforts to really increase corporate responsibility and due diligence. Now, this proposal does go after sort of the big multinationals, those with a turnover, I believe, of 120 million plus. But is that really the right approach? To focus so specifically on the big companies? Um, well, I mean, I can start by saying our standards apply to all companies, regardless of size. So we recognize that uh, due diligence might be adapted based on the specific circumstances of a company um, and the resources they have at hand, but also their risk profile. Um, but that broadly, all companies should be doing this uh, to the extent they need to based on risk again. Um, so in the context of international standards, we think the application is broader. We have seen, however, governments, you know, really when they're introducing due diligence legislation to as an initial step, focus on big companies. And I mean, that makes sense politically as a first step, I would say, you know, it, it, it also in a sense um, makes sense because those are the companies that will have had the most experience with this um, that will have resources to invest in, in establishing good due diligence processes that then, you know, potentially we could learn from and extrapolate to, to other businesses. Um, I mean, I think one risk of excluding SMEs from the expectation is that, um, I think, as you mentioned, and um, I think the commissioner mentioned, uh, the representative from the commission mentioned also, um, SMEs will still be captured because, of course, they're part of uh, global value chains of, of large companies. So in any case, they will be subject to sort of cascading requirements through these contractual assurances. They'll be subject to audits. Um, and indirectly, you know, the, these expectations will, will come to them. Um, and in a way, um, potentially kind of capturing that already in a law and making clear what the limits of those expectations are and to what extent SMEs can adapt, prioritize, 
um, you know, evolve their due diligence over time based on uh, resource constraints, that that could be could have been useful, I think. Um, in, in this current situation, SMEs now might just be subject to um, expectations as outlined by uh, their buyers or other bigger companies um, in the supply chain that that have you know economic leverage over them, um, and that could lead to inconsistency. It can also lead to, as been mentioned a few times, these uh, expectations really just being passed passed down to actors that are less able to comply with them. So. I think that's a risk that um, needs to be considered. It is something also that could be potentially addressed, you know, through Article 14, as Dion was mentioning. Uh, we really need to be thinking about what supporting measures will be most useful here. Um, due diligence expectations, they're not a silver bullet. You know, the, the issues we're talking about, Rana Plaza, that didn't happen just because a few garment companies, you know, were re- sourcing irresponsibly. Those are also, of course, a result of infrastructure issues uh, in a developing country, lack of investment, uh, lack of um, economic development issues. So there needs to be, in addition to this, of course, support to SMEs, technical and financial support, but then also ODA and international engagement and development assistance to poor countries that haven't been sort of um, successful in enforcing labor, environmental and human rights uh, expectations. And as a result, you know, that that's really sort of what leads leads to these issues at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, so on SME specifically, um, I would say, uh, I think it, it's, you know, n- not ideal, but it is a difficult issue. And, you know, we also recognize that this is, this is a first step, this law is going to be reviewed in, uh, I think, there's a seven year review clause. At that stage, the commission can consider how to expand it, whether to expand it to SMEs. There's also an allowance for high-risk sectors uh, for medium-sized companies to be included in the scope. So for garments, minerals, agriculture, um, we would argue maybe the financial sector should also be included there as you know, small venture capital firms are often the ones investing in really risky industries and often have a lot of leverage actually to, to promote responsible business conduct uh, uh, across those industries. Um, but you know, broadly, I would say from the OECD that that, that hasn't been sort of the focus um, or our, our priority issue regarding the law because we sort of understand, I guess, the rationale that went that went behind. Um, uh, you know, risky the, industries there. Um, let me go to Dr. Veronique Stukas. Um, you know, your organization obviously um, promotes and supports you know the proper use of nickel, but can mining and your industry ever really be ethical? Well, I do think that it is definitely possible for industries to be act ethical and to um, make sure that the appropriate frameworks are established to um, support well both the communities, but also to make sure that there are no impacts um, with respect to the um, activities that the mining sector is doing. So, for instance, I think I heard the raising awareness, the importance of raising awareness. And I do think that that is very important, especially in countries where maybe some of the practices that we are very familiar with in Europe are not really established yet. So as Nickel Institute, for instance, we have, uh, we are working now to develop a nickel mark. So a framework that will provide, yeah, really a framework for all companies to raise ESG standards where necessary. We also have developed, we already have developed a um, joint due diligence standard. This was specifically to um, to comply with uh, requirements from the London Metal Exchange, but it's also available to everybody. We have also developed a GHG, GHG greenhouse gas emissions <laughs> a guidance document for measuring greenhouse gas emissions from nickel production. And that's also made available for everybody. So there's quite a lot that we are, that we can do to make sure that, to raise awareness on the one hand, and to make sure as well that the impact of um, our industry on the environment and on the communities are minimized as much as possible. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, Now I understand we've already lost one uh, one MEP who had to leave for um, another engagement. Um, We're also gonna lose our commission representative. Um, So if you could just quickly wrap up your thoughts very quickly then before you leave, please. 
Uh, well, well, I can say is that uh, it's yet another very good opportunity to exchange on the proposal. Uh, for us, it's enriching to hear uh, views. We have done so before preparing the proposal, and we will certainly continue engaging with uh, stakeholders to, to uh, get more feedback on what uh, we proposed. I tried to explain that we, we try to strike the right balance between uh, political ambition and implementation. Uh, as a way of pushing through this proposal, uh, corporates, but also public authorities and other stakeholders towards this path or sustainability path that uh, we would like to see emerging more and more. Um, and I hope that uh, this proposal also put on the table the right tools uh, to do so for the companies, but also for the member states to implement it and um, for victims to use in case of uh, uh, harm uh, occurring. So uh, it's in the hands of the co-legislators. Uh, we have to see uh, what will come uh, up in the end. But in the meantime, let me maybe finish with a call. And I think it was already mentioned by some. We should be using this time um, between now and when the new rules will kick in to see how we can prepare all stakeholders uh, to implement uh, new rules. Uh, this change doesn't come over time. It's costly uh, for, for companies. It, we should also need, need to raise awareness among stakeholders um, and other actors. So um, I think there we need to see collaboration and cooperation and concrete ideas how we can best prepare the ground. We on, on the side of the Commission are preparing through our development cooperation tools, trade instrument tools and any support tools we have to support companies and SMEs. But more needs to be done uh, because we cannot only pull this uh, shift towards sustainability uh, from Brussels and uh, just uh, sitting in commission offices. We need to really work together, public and private and at all levels. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Anna, Anna Sopoulou, um, and also Manu Opre, uh, MEP of the European Parliament, um, who have unfortunately had to leave. Okay, well, let's continue. Um, Elena Lunder, um, you know, we've heard a lot of things being said here, um, some sort of criticisms about this uh, proposal, but, you know, you, you, when it comes to really, you know, big brands, um, you know, I won't name some of them because I might get um, in a bit of trouble. But, you know, we hear so much the news right now um, of these sort of big brands using cheap child labour um, or cheap labour in general sweatshops. What can this proposal do to really tackle that? Um, thank you for this question. Um, so it can do a lot. I think that in general, the proposal is an important step um, in, in tackling um, this lack of accountability that we can see now. Um, but more, more specifically, I think um, one important point that I already mentioned is, is, I think, purchasing practices, because it's an important tool in sharing responsibility, um, in, in adapting own practices to enable better practices by other actors in the supply chain and create a positive knock-on effect. Um, another point that we focus on a lot um, is also the importance of um, companies through their due diligence of, of their own purchasing practices, also assessing their pricing practices um, and the contribution that they are making to the ability of, for example, smallholder farmers to be able to earn a living income. Um, it is already a great um, development that the annex to the proposal that um, outlines particular um, rights and prohibitions um, refers to the prohibition of withholding a living wage, which is um, instrumental in, in tackling um, uh, working conditions in global supply chains and in supply chains of, of such brands and when it comes to child labor for example um, looking at the situation of in in, in, in the agricultural uh, sector for example it is also essential to include living income in this um, conversation because living income to a uh, uh, smallholder farmer family can mean the ability for for the family members or for the workers that they might employ occasionally to earn a living income or a living wage. So an insufficient income, so an insufficient price for that goes below the cost of production is the, the easiest way to, to offset this, this minus that the farmer, for example, receives or, or a producer or a factory owner can offset this minus that they receive from the price is through labor costs, which are the most flexible in, in many cases. So 
um, really looking at prices um, is key where, because a, a clear connection has been made with, with higher wages and, and prices above the cost of production. Okay, let me bring in Janusz then, then um, to, to, to sort of follow in from, from what you just said then. Um, we're talking about, you know, the human rights of the people in the supply chain. Do you think this proposal makes human rights a kind of afterthought? I mean, you want the industry, of course, to take more responsibility. Um, you talk about the sectoral approach, cross-sector collaboration, best practices. Um, talk us through how you feel this proposal um, is going to impact the lives of the kind of farmers and miners and workers, the people, you know, in a way, the low hanging fruit, you could say. I think you have muted yourself. If you could just unmute. Sorry, sorry for that. Um, <laughs> The same way the proposal of the Commission and the future regulation in combination with other regulations, especially the ones on uh, sustainability reporting uh, and including also the European sustainability reporting standards, which uh, are now being discussed. Of course, we're going to look at the quality of how companies define their policies and strategies on due diligence and what is it that they put in place to uh, support uh, the suppliers in their value chains? But then we will go one step further down and see locally what is it that they invest in, put in place. And for instance, uh, I mentioned that, where is it that in regions where uh, I think you were referring uh, to the mining sector, where is it that you develop a diversified economic uh, ecosystem? So that through new education path, especially vocational education, technical education, you can train the younger generations, especially the young people that are in these mines, take them out, put them back into vocational education and see where you equip them with the skills for the new jobs uh, in these regions where mining is a monopoly. That is... Uh, where we see impact also on livelihoods. Eh? Um, and then, indeed, uh, this discussion about wages and living income needs to be further discussed. They are not enough discussed. Also, in relation to some goodwill, but ending with bad practice. I remember discussion with the International Federation of Human Rights, working with large companies, and where they identified that the increase of wages had as an impact to see doctors and teachers from sc local schools leaving their job to enter the fabric to make sportswear shoes or footballs. Thank you very much. That was not an all-inclusive approach locally designed uh, to, to avoid this kind of problem because that's the last thing we want to see happening. So this sector alliances where you have room to discuss these difficult and complex issues and to fine-tune what is needed uh, at local level to address the root causes and to see where the solutions will not have negative effects. We need places to discuss that. And so far, it's on a voluntary basis. But this is more the exception today than the rule. So where do you see uh, in the next five years all industry sectors taking on board the due diligence debate, not only from a compliance perspective, which is extremely important, but also from all the other elements that can contribute to enhance the livelihoods of, of workers. Okay, well, Mr. Nordstrom, you brought up mining there and you were talking there about um, you know, how you develop the ecosystem. So to our industry rep then, Dr. Veronique Stuckers, um, the one other thing that I also want to talk to you about, I mean, we are sort of running out of time a little bit, um, but the question I really had for you was, where in this proposal does it really make companies face up to how their operations um, have an impact, um, but also impact biodiversity loss? And there are huge risks um, if that isn't addressed, because those risks are, of course, increasing. 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm listening to this conversation and uh, the more I listen to this, the more I see that there's uh, sectors really do have very different impacts and the impacts that we are talking about may not be directly applicable to all different sectors where it comes, for instance, to human rights, which with the exception of probably artisanal mining, it's probably a little bit less of an issue. Wages and income is a bit less of an issue in the mining sector. But indeed, yes, the environmental impact is much more uh, something that we concentrate on when we are looking at uh, responsible sourcing requirements and when we are developing framework for the companies, basically. And so this is definitely one of the main um, focus areas for the mining industry. And I've forgotten your question. Um, the question was simply about um, biodiversity. Um, so how do you make sure that um, biodiversity is a factor going forward? Yeah, it definitely is where it comes to the mining industry and it has always been, for instance, rehabilitation is something that the mining industry has always worked on from the start. As soon as the mining or part of the mining um, is closed, rehabilitation of, of, um, yeah, of, of, of the biodiversity or of of the forests that were there before but we need to make sure as well that well mining is very different as well and the impact even the environmental impact is very different depending on the country where the mining is done for nickel for instance right now there's a huge focus on indonesia because there is quite a lot of um mining developing right now in indonesia which could have quite some impact on the biodiversity of uh, Indonesia and so this is where then the raising awareness with all stakeholders the regulators but also the companies and making sure that they abide to things like the mining principles of ICMM or towards sustainable mining or the copper mark nickel mark that we are developing and which we hope will in future also be aligned and approved by the OCD and uh, the UN well, aligned with the UN guiding principles. So all of this really is very important. And we do see a lot of um, questions coming to the nickel industry right now, especially from the value chain. Uh, the likes of Tesla, for instance, are very active in Indonesia as well, are also raising awareness around the impact of nickel mining in Indonesia which uh, I think we've said it before, multi-stakeholder discussion and communication is very important. Okay, um, we literally only have like about a minute left. So I'm gonna throw it all, uh, throw, um, throw it back to you guys for your final comments, but with a question, what are your sort of minimum and maximum expectations um, for the European Commission and the European Parliament going forward? Um, start with Barbara Yelich, please, very quickly. Um, I guess the minimum expectation, again, would just be to align with existing standards. So the UNGPs, but of course, OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and the due diligence uh, framework that supports that. The maximum would really be, again, to think of a more comprehensive approach, which I know that the commission is doing, but thinking about how to then also um, uh, energize their, their ODA, trade support, um, other other mechanisms and, and tools to, to support this agenda more broadly and sort of also connecting the dots across all the different initiatives that we see, had, um, excuse me, the EU has going on. So the EU Green Deal, um, the Sustainable Finance Action Plan, how does all this fit together? Um, how can we streamline expectations for, for the same objectives? Okay, lovely. Um, Yen, Notre Dame, your final thoughts, minimum, maximum expectations quickly. Well, we would like to encourage uh, not only the uh, participants here today, but far more actors to uh, focus on this Article 14 in the proposal of the Commission. You will see that the proposal is disproportionate. Uh, we need a much more robust approach on this duty to collaborate with, I would say, using the words, governments must, companies must, industry associations must. And also the commission, if you read the article, it is said, commission may consider. No, it's not about may anymore. Must come with complementary and supportive measures. At, uh, 
at, at the best level. Now, uh, I just would like to refer to one, something that was completely silent the day the proposal came out. Um, it is a publication from DG, the commission from DG INTPA, together with the ITC, the International Trade Center. It's um, guidance on designing effective and inclusive accompanying support to supply chain legislation. So guidance on designing effective and inclusive accompanying support. That we, we can provide the link. But look at how uh, these supportive measures have been described according to each player. And that is what we are really expecting a lot so that we have a European integrated approach on two solid legs, the regulation and the supportive measures. Okay, Ella Yolanda, your final thoughts, minimum maximum expectations, but I'm going to have to ask you to be very short, please. Okay, but well, I'm lucky. I think um, I can just uh, support what has been said until now. I think minimum definitely is just to align with the existing uh, understanding of what the diligence is on the basis of UNGPs and OECD guidelines. Um, and then maximum should go more into the direction of, of supporting a collaborative approach, both with third countries and with companies um, within and outside of Europe, so that effective change can happen um, and that it doesn't remain a compliance exercise. Okay, and then lastly, Dr. Veronique Stukas. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure I would formulate minimum and maximum expectations, but I think that definitely we want to ensure that human rights are respected, that the environmental issues are addressed. And again, from an Eagle Institute perspective or from a metals and minerals um, sector, it's very important that the work done, that we have already done, is recognized, especially where it comes to, again, multi-stakeholder multi um, engagement, uh, especially if it's been it's gone through an OCD alignment process and um, that the efforts of the industry in this uh, are recognized and also that there is coherence again because there's a lot coming our way from different areas and the more coherent all those requirements are be it legal or value chain requirement the easier it is for everybody and the more efficient it is so Okay, well, thank you to all of your, all of the panelists. Um, I literally don't know where the time has gone today, um, but we are going to have to leave it there. So to Anna Athana Sopalu, Manu Opre, MEP, Barbara Bielic, Yen Notre Dame, Elena Lunder, and Dr. Brilliant Stuckers, thank you so much for being part of this discussion this morning. And to everyone watching online, I do hope that what you've seen has given you a flavor of the debate surrounding due diligence and responsible sourcing. I'm Arm Zaidi, and you've been watching a Euro. Active debate supported by the Nickel Institute. Take care and bye bye.